As we saw in part one, we now have a model that describes how CO2 concentration varies in a room. So what does this actually tell us? Well, it tells us that if we know all the variables listed here, then our model will give us the rate of change of CO2. For example, let's say we have a room that has a volume of 40 meters cubed. This could be a room of say 4 by 4 by 2.5 meters. Also, we know that the outdoor concentration is 400 parts per million, and that the CO2 generation rate is 4 parts per million meters cubed per second per person, which is normal for a sedentary person. The units here may look a little confusing, but we can just ignore them for calculations in this case and consider just the numerical values. At this instant in time, T1, there are two people in the room. The ventilation rate is 0 0.02 meters cubed per second, and the CO2 concentration in the room is 600 ppm. At this instant, our model tells us that the amount of CO2 will be increasing at a rate of 0.1 parts per million per second. In other words, if we were to plot CO2 versus time, the slope or gradient of this graph would be 0.1. The difficulty comes because this is the gradient only at this instant in time, T1. And if everything else stays the same, as C changes, so will the gradient of the graph. So the gradient depends on C and C depends on the gradient. For example, if at some later time, T2, the concentration in the room is 1000 ppm, then our model now tells us that CO2 will instead be falling at a rate of 0.1 ppm per second. Since there is a value of C where the rate of change is positive, meaning that C is increasing, and a value of C where the rate of change is negative, meaning that C is decreasing, then it makes sense that there is a value of C somewhere in between, where the rate of change is zero, meaning that C will not change in time. We call this the steady value, and we will write this as C steady. We can evaluate this by simply setting dc by dt to zero and solving for C. Once we do this and substitute our numbers in, we find that in this example, when the CO2 level is 800 ppm, the room is at steady state or equilibrium meaning the CO2 level will not change in time. Therefore, for a given room with a given number of people, if the ventilation rate stays constant, we would expect the CO2 level to gradually tend from some initial value, or initial condition, towards the steady value, and will then remain at the steady value. Do we know a common function that has this characteristic of tending towards and then remaining at a constant value? Exponential functions have this property, and this is an additional clue for solving this equation. The model predicts that we will remain at this steady CO2 level until something changes. But if something changes, this will give us a new steady value. For example, we can see that if the number of people increases, so does the equilibrium CO2. Also, if the ventilation rate increases, we predict the equilibrium CO2 will decrease. Notice that we've arrived at these conclusions without actually needing to solve the differential equation. Also, notice that the steady value does not depend on the size of the room, since V is not present here. So, what else does our model tell us? Let's imagine you are the first person to design a spacecraft to carry people into space. We know that for people to survive the vacuum of space, we must seal the spacecraft to fill it with air. This means no air leaves or enters the spacecraft. In other words, the spacecraft may be thought of as a perfectly sealed room. This means the ventilation rate is zero. Notice that in this case, the rate of change of C no longer depends on C as before. This tells us that the rate of change of CO2 is equal to a constant and CO2 will increase at this rate indefinitely, starting at some initial condition. Therefore, our solution in the perfectly sealed case is a straight line with this equation. 
Do we see a problem with this? Can the CO2 concentration increase forever? What effects will this have on the astronauts inside? Although we are modeling the amount of CO2 in a room, we could produce a similar model for oxygen. The difference being that people consume oxygen and produce CO2. Therefore, without a source of oxygen in a perfectly sealed room, oxygen will steadily reduce until there is none left for us to breathe. This tells us that we need a method to produce oxygen and remove CO2 on board a spacecraft to counteract what is consumed and produced by the occupants. So, do perfectly sealed rooms exist in our day-to-day -day life? Thankfully not. While you could certainly construct one, all rooms we use regularly are not perfectly sealed. When we close all windows and doors, this does significantly reduce the ventilation rate, but it will not reduce it to zero. It is a good thing this is true, or we would be installing oxygen tanks in our room. Gaps around windows and door frames, and even air coming through brickwork, all ensure there is air for us to breathe inside, but opening windows is useful to increase ventilation. While the solution for a perfectly sealed room is fairly straightforward, we have a more complicated scenario when there's ventilation present, meaning Q is greater than zero. If the ventilation rate and all other factors are constant, we can use the separation of variables method to solve this. We aren't going to go through this method in detail, and we will just quickly show the main steps here. But if you want to learn more about how to solve this, you can refer to the document linked in the description. This solution tells us how the CO2 concentration, C, changes in time, T, for a given initial concentration, Ci, at initial time, Ti, if all other parameters are constant. While this might look like an intimidating equation, if you take a close look, it actually takes a fairly simple functional form of an exponential with just a few constants. So what does all of this mean? Well, let's run through an example to see if our solution behaves as we expect it to from our previous discussion. Let's say, like our earlier example, we have a room that is 40 meters cubed. The outdoor concentration is 400 ppm, and the CO2 generation rate is 4 ppm meters cubed per second per person. Now let's walk through a day in this room that we will say is an office. We start at 7 a.m. and set this time as 0 seconds, so Ti equals 0. The room has been empty all night, so we take the initial CO2 concentration, Ci, as 400 ppm. Work doesn't start till 9 a.m., so the occupancy is currently 0. All windows and doors are closed in the room, but there is a ventilation leak rate of 0.005 meters cubed per second through the small gaps to the outside. We substitute these numbers into our equation and find that everything cancels, meaning that C remains constant at the outdoor level of 400 ppm. And this is what we expect. With nobody in the room to produce CO2, the level will remain unchanged. Let's graph out the CO2 levels and move some variables down here to keep track of them as they change. Now, at 9 a.m., two people arrive to the office, increasing n to 2. Because n has changed, we need to update our initial conditions and we take the value of ti and ci from the n conditions of the previous section. So ti becomes 2 hours or 7200 seconds and ci is 400 ppm. They keep the doors and windows shut, so the ventilation rate stays at 0.005 cubic meters per second. And when we substitute this into our solution, we get an expression for C as a function of time, and we can add this to our graph. We can see that the CO2 builds up in the room. At 11 a.m., the room starts to feel stuffy, and a window is opened, increasing the ventilation rate to Q is equal to 0.015 cubic meters per second. Like before, we take the initial conditions from the end of the previous section, so Ti becomes 4 hours, or 14,400 seconds, and Ci is updated to 1,350 ppm. Again, we substitute these values into our equation to get a new expression. As we plot this, we now see a reduction in CO2 concentration.
From here, we can just continue the same procedures as thing change. At 12.30, both people leave for a one-hour lunch break and leave the window open. At 1.30, they return and find the office is slightly cold, so close the window slightly, reducing the ventilation rate to 0.01 cubic meters per second. At 3, one person leaves for the day to collect children from school. At 5 p.m., the other person leaves for the day and closes the window, so Q returns to 0.005 cubic meters per second. And we now have a full prediction for how the CO2 levels will change throughout the day. We can see that generally CO2 levels increase as more people enter the room or windows are shut, and levels generally decrease as people leave or windows are opened. We also see that once a change is made, there is a tendency for the CO2 levels to approach a certain steady value. Let's take a step back and remind ourselves that all of this comes from a single equation we derived in part one. This means that at every location on this graph, this equation must be satisfied. So let's test the point. If we zoom in around 10 a.m., we see this. If we sub all the values at 10 a.m. into our equation, we see that CO2 should be increasing at a rate of 0 0.128 ppm per second. And if we take the gradient of a tangent light at this point, we find that the gradient is indeed 0 0.128. Therefore, we can say that this equation is satisfied. You can try out many other points on the graph and we'll always find that the equation is satisfied. This demonstrates that this entire graph with all of its seemingly complex regions is fully governed by just one equation. Maybe you have a CO2 monitor available at your school or university that can tell you the CO2 concentration. Mm. Why not use this to see if our model matches reality? Do CO2 levels increase as more people enter the room? Do CO2 levels fall when a window is opened? And after some time into a long lesson, does the CO2 reach an approximately stable or steady value? You might also want to use this model to think about how certain factors affect CO2 levels. For example, what effect would a smaller office have on our example? What about if there was a third occupant? What if the windows were unable to open because of furniture blocking them? or because they are in an inaccessible location. We hope you enjoyed learning about this interesting application of mathematics, and thank you for watching.